All right. Here we are, kids. Wednesday, October 20th, 3 p.m. Pacific time. Welcome to another episode of Camera and Flask. And once again, it just has to be, I am flying solo today because our good friend Caleb Pike is uh, almost mended, but still on the mend. And our other good friend, Ben Barden, the third partner in crime with this whole thing, is on a project right now in England and has an extremely early call tomorrow. So I thought, let's just go ahead and do this thing. This wish challenge is going to happen next week, the 27th. So there you go. Uh, wraps of this. Welcome, Mitch. Welcome, 360 grad. Welcome, and uh, the numbers are astronomical right now. We're waiting for that. What is it? It's about a, a three to five minute delay where everybody gets notified that the live stream is live. Maybe some more people will pop in. But before we do that, you wish 360 grad. We are going to pour a drink. Here it is. Uh, you know, being from Scotland, I should probably know how to pronounce this. But this is the Abalor Abuna. It's uh, cast strength 122 point four proof by this one so it's a 61.2 uh, percent batch number 69 and this i have to tell you at the moment is my favorite scotch in fact if you have ever had um my goodness i've just gone blank oh bookers which is a bourbon that is some seriously strong stuff that's my favorite probably my favorite uh bourbon and this Kind of reminds me of that, but in, in scotch form, it definitely needs water. So here we go. We're going to go ahead and put some of that in there. And uh, a little bit more than I would normally put because it is so dang strong. But it is delicious. Cheers. Slangeva. Hmm. And there it is. Tastes good. And people are coming in. Roz is here. Sky's here. Uh, the Gefferin Grip and Bill, David, who else is coming here? Clap, clap, clap. Hey, evening. Let me know what you're drinking. Let it or unlet it. Oliver's here. Hey, and cheers. And we've got some things to talk about today, kiddos. This is, this is like the, the mini NAB week. When was NAB supposed to be? Was it supposed to be this week? Maybe it was. I don't know. Everything just keeps getting canceled across the boards. So now companies just say, let's announce some stuff. Apple's been doing it for a while. And uh, I think we're going to talk about that stuff. So as I said in the title, we're going to talk about from Baghdad. What are you doing in Baghdad, small brown fox? Um, we're going to talk about new MacBook Pros. We are going to talk about new Aperture Ameren lights. And we're going to talk about uh, a small camera, if you want to call it that, announcement from DJI. And it's all about the chat. So I know you're working there. Of course you're working. Well, I think that is probably obvious. Roz is having very unleaded dot, dot, dot. I think we're supposed to have a follow-up. Is that water? That's about as unleaded as it gets. And uh, let's just get into this. All right, let's talk about these things first. I'm going to share my screen. Boom. MacBook Pro. We've got two versions in terms of size, and we've got two versions in terms of silicon chip. Uh, everybody who's, you know, not living under a rock and is paying attention or cares about this stuff knows what this is. But essentially, we've 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 gone forwards and we've gone backwards all at the same time, which means that, <laughs> I mean, currently I'm running off of a late 2019, pretty much packed MacBook Pro. So I've got my four Thunderbolt ports, which are also USB-C based in terms of shape. Uh, there's no dedicated power connector like there used to be and there now will be 
and there's no additional ports. That's it. You've got to get, I can't even tell you what's plugged into this thing to make everything that I need to work work. But uh, essentially, you know, if you are familiar with a 2015 MacBook Pro, it's kind of like they're putting uh, the, the M1 Pro and M1 Max chips into those. So, yeah. So let's just talk about this briefly. So this is next evolution of the M1 chip. But I think we talk about the hardware first. We've got a new keyboard again. We have um, lots and lots of ports, which are probably in here. There we go. Look, HDMI. We've got one Thunderbolt port on this side, and we've got an SD card slot on this side. Who thought SD cards were going to go away, by the way? What idiot thought that? No, they weren't going away. And then on the other side, it's I'm on New Shooter right now. I'm sure they'll show. Oh, it's probably up here. I'm being a dodo head. Um, let me move some Ecamm stuff out of the way, which I don't need to see right now because I'm okay. And then we'll see here. Boom. Did that work? No, it didn't. Uh, here we go. Let's try that. There we go. MagSafe. And then there's also two uh, Thunderbolt 3 connectors on that side as well. What's interesting about this is that the HDMI port is only HDMI 2.0, not 2.1, which means that it's going to push out uh, a 60 hertz, but you can't go higher than that. Um, which I think is kind of interesting because is it on another one of their products they do in fact have uh, HDMI 2.1 I think that's on the Apple TV if I'm right yeah so there you go um, fast as all heck this thing's going to be a beast with uh, especially the Max version the M1 Max and honestly, for me personally, I'd be going for a 16 inch if I was dropping this much coin on this system. And I would probably spec it out all the way with a two terabyte SSD. I think that jump for an extra thousand dollars to get to the next largest SSD doesn't make a lot of sense. But um, yeah. But if you if you dig deeper, by the way, um, you know you'll see that that that's the case. Mm, what else do we have on here? Eh, you know they're going to be fast. The screen apparently is good enough for um, if you're doing HDR and you're working in HDR. Looks like we've got a thousand nit uh, with a fifteen. 1500 nit peak brightness and what grumpy penguin insane and uh they're gonna scream uh, you know my viewpoint is this you've got the m1 pro you've got the m1 max ultimately it's gonna boil down to this if you work in video then you're gonna get the m1 max and that's the way i think about it um my opinion, but again, I think if you're working in video, you take that system, you go to 64 gigabytes of uh, shared RAM, you go to the M1 Max, two terabyte drive, you spec it out. It's 4,300 bucks. It's not really any different than the previous version, except for it's going to be a lot faster, a lot more efficient. And what's nice is the M1 chip has been out long enough now that uh, that most of the apps that we would use have already been optimized for M1. So that's great. And then, yes, uh, the Max has uh, basically, you know, encoders or decoders or both for ProRes, which I think is great. And uh, hopefully when we see another iteration of something like Final Cut Pro, we'll get even more controls for ProRes RAW inside of the application. Will we? I don't know. I guess we'll have to see. So there's a lot to talk about there. But I think for what they're doing, 
even though it's a lot of money for a laptop computer if you look at comparables out there if we can get companies uh you know to like unreal engine to take um everything that they're doing with unity and everything else and really optimize it it already looks like you know uh da vinci's on board with it and everything else i think it's pretty cool and yes 360 grad there is a notch um the only saving grace there and trust me i'm not somebody who's gonna back anybody up on this or say you know this is something that i think is okay but that little notch there that's um on the on the computer is a little funky right um and it's big for there just being a 1080p camera there saving grace it's a 16 by 10 so your viewable area below your menus and and stuff can still be what it needs to be um i don't know why the notch is so big on this thing i really don't i don't know if they're just mentally getting us prepared for the fact that the next iteration of this is going to have the same size notch so that they can put face id and other things into it that's the only thing i can think of because once you get used to something you get used to it but if they had a tiny notch and then a year from now they go ahead and they make that notch bigger then everybody's gonna really go crazy so let them bitch about it right now and then <laughs> the notch is the size of the notch and and they can add things to it so um <laughs> exactly grumpy penguin so yeah it's you know I don't know. Is the display the same as the Apple Pro display? I don't know. I mean, they're definitely taking technology that's in the, is it the iPad Pro and, and some of the new stuff that they're doing in terms of the LEDs and everything else. Um, it's definitely got that adaptive refresh rate. So it can go up to 120 hertz and then it's adaptive depending on what kind of content is being delivered. But one thing from the keynote that I did notice is for pros, you can turn that adaptive feature on and off so you can lock it to a particular hertz based on your workflow and what you're doing. I don't want 120 hertz when I'm working on video that I'm editing at 24 frames per second. Round it up, of course. Mm-hmm. Any other thoughts on these MacBook Pros that we want to talk about? They are what they are. They call it a liquid retina HDR display. I'm sure they're going to be great. They're going to be, I think, a little bit heavier than the previous gen. And um, I think it's going to be all right. And I think that these computers are going to scream when people are working on them. And they're definitely going to be attractive to developers to optimize what they have to that we'll see we'll see if what apple is doing can entice enough for companies that are making you know 3d based solutions where they tap into that gpu the way they are with other manufacturers i'd like that um yes but it is if you are a final cut pro user if you're a logic user but i think even if you're a Resolve user and you're a Creative Cloud user, um, there's definitely going to be some advantages to this. And yeah, I agree, Neil. I think it's their great end of story. There's not a lot more that they could have done. Uh, there's definitely things that they could have done, but there's not a lot more at this point in time. I think this is a big leap. So ultimately, it boils down to, do you like the way the thing looks? I think it'll be fine. Um, I don't think there's going to be any issues with performance, but we'll find out. So there you go. I don't think Resolve's going to move to accept ProRes, but we'll see. Really depends, but uh, interesting because, you know, when you look at the marketplace, you look at Apple as a company, what's interesting is while they're very different companies, in some ways, Black Magic design parallels them because they are both a hardware and a software company now so they're not making computers 
but they are making cameras, and that will definitely play into the choices they make in terms of what they're supporting, I think. Um, yeah, and it'll be interesting to see if long-term Apple, nobody's really discussed this, are they going to take these chips and make them available to anybody else, or will it strictly be their ecosystem? I'd be interested to see what happens with that. So there you go. We're done with the MacBook Pro conversation, uh, unless anybody else wants to bring anything up. And then now I think what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about um, Aperture and what they did with the Ameren line. So let's go ahead and talk about that. So I don't know if we call these updates or entirely new products. It's definitely, to me, a bit of a refresh from some of the older stuff that they had. Um, in some ways, I kind of feel like the P60 line is Aperture's answer to a company like Luxly and what they're doing with the cello lights and things like that. I would categorize these as on-camera and smaller off-camera lighting fixtures. We've got the P60X, which is a bicolor unit, the C for color. And, um, you know, price points are very interesting. They're not coming with remote controls. They look like they have quite good output for their size. Little funky softbox. We've seen things similar to that. And we're going from um, uh, 3200, I believe, to 6500 Kelvin. And price point, very reasonable, I think, for what it is that they are putting out in the market. You got 349 US for the P60C and then P60X at 249. And then they have some kits. I wouldn't necessarily personally be looking at these lights as a three cam, uh, three lighting kit um, type of lighting solution. I would look to pick up one or two of these fixtures and have them in my kit to use with other lighting fixtures, whether that was a 300, a 600, some other manufacturer's light, um, a larger panel light, along with one or two of the smaller ones. And that really brings up the next, you know, product that we're looking at from Aperture, which is, and again, branded in their uh, 60 line, but these are the COB 60X and 60D lights. So these are shrunken down versions in a way of what we're seeing with the 100 and the 200. These are chip on board fixtures. And again, we have a bicolor option and then also a color option. Uh, sorry, reverse that. We have a daylight option and then a bicolor option and look to be very compact. They can run off of NPF style batteries. There's a dual battery uh, option here, as you can see. And then, you know, they have the Bowens mount, so you're gonna be able to use all of those fixtures. Again, I think that these are not lights that I would think of as kit lights. This is something that I would add to my kit. So for a kicker, you know, uh, a rim light for, you know, things like that. Prices are great. I mean, 169 for the daylight, 199 for the bicolor. Probably go for the daylight if you just want more output from the light. But for me, when I'm looking at smaller fixtures like this, I kind of feel like having that bicolor option that's the versatility I want. And the range is a little better than the panels. Uh, we're going from 2,700 Kelvin to 6,500 Kelvin. And, you know, I, I think um, I think for the money, they're in the right place. You'll have to decide, is it better to go with the 100 or 200 for more output, or will the 60 do? I could definitely see a COB 60X in my kit. And I think that would be a great little light to have. Um, and you can use the Sidus Link app to control all this stuff. So there you go. Um, from what I can see, no bad steps there from Apple. I mean, from Apple, from Aperture. Lots of A's in, in the releases this week. But 
yeah, David says the COB lights with that size and still using full size Bowens mount is great. Yeah, because there are lights on the market that have like this mini style Bowens mount. I like the fact that it's standardized. So you can use your fixtures. You know, we can go so high ISO right now on camera systems. They're so sensitive to light that you can take a smaller fixture in a controlled environment like I'm in right now. And you could put that into a large softbox and still get a really great image because you can crank your ISO on your camera. It's when you start to have a lot of ambient light, when you start to have a lot of um, well, ambient light, that that becomes a lot more difficult. So if you're in a black box, then you for sure can use smaller fixtures that have less output and then put them into bigger modifiers and you can get really great results. As soon as I open all the windows in this space, you know, those windows start to open up and I start to do stuff in this space and I have a lot of ambient light, that's when you start to run into problems and you start to need to have bigger fixtures to start to work with all of that. Um, yes, David, you're waiting for your P600C. None of these. Understood. Don't know how long the wait is. Um... And yeah, neither did I see uh, Noir et Blanc V. I'm pronouncing that. I butchered that. Uh, didn't really see a Tri-8 replacement build-wise. That would be nice. Yeah, the the Tri-8 is a really interesting light because it, it's, if I'm remembering correctly, and I have one somewhere, it's got this virtually indestructible um, front, and it's got this um, LED array that's irregular so that it's not just, you know, blasting you. It also has a a for aperture in the middle of it uh, really interesting fixture and essentially bulletproof um so there you go i just got a uh, a message from matt allard from new shooter asking me what i thought about the ronin 4d so i'll have to answer that in a little while uh don't ship till next year on the 600 okay that's a little bit of a waiting game all right so questions or comments just put in at the c47 in the comments there so I can see them and uh, call them out. And right now, let's have a conversation about that. We're gonna talk about that other Franken something in a minute, but what do we wanna talk about in terms of lights, about the laptops or anything like that? Let's go ahead and get into that. Um, I had the old Ameren LEDs, this is Michael. They are okay for starters that need a quote unquote cheap but solid solution, but actually like the Young Nui O YN360 light sticks. Where do they come up with these names? In addition to an Aperture 120D plus big softbox. Makes sense. Um, and they don't come with batteries anymore. Yeah, well, you know, they got to keep that price point lower. And NPF style batteries are a dime a dozen. Not quite a dime, but they are very easily um, obtainable through many different third party manufacturers. And my experience has generally been good with those overall. So, you know, there's options. Um, let me just scroll up and see if there's anything I'm missing. And let's go ahead and get some other questions here. Hello, Shazam. Sigma released a new little APS-C 2.8 zoom, uh, but they got buried. I saw that. Isn't that an 18 to 50? I'm pretty sure, Chris. I did see that released. Um, hard space to be in unless you're maybe creating lenses now for like, you know, we're starting to see manufacturers starting to create a lot more lenses for Fuji, uh, Fuji's X mount. And I could see putting some attention on APS-C there. I love Super 35 and APS-C, but when you're making an investment into lenses, there is something to be said unless they're very cost effective generally Fuji's lenses are, to buying full frame lenses and then using them on crop sensor cameras. Just more versatility overall. Um, let's see what else we've got. Looking at any other questions. Uh, Michael's going to test the new XML workflow between Final Cut Pro and Logic. And by the way, the new tracker that Apple put into Final Cut Pro looks really good. There's a video that um, Mark Spencer and Steve Martin from Ripple Training put out, which shows you some of that stuff. 
Um, so I'll go back to what I was saying before, Bill. Do you think that the P60C would work as a key light? Well, first of all, I think my my guess is that the X is going to have better um, overall output. And if I was using it for lighting interviews and stuff, I'd go with a bicolor unit generally, even though um, you could absolutely use the P60C. I would look at the metrics on that you know, and the output and see whether or not you're getting as much output at a daylight or a tungsten color temperature with the P60C as you are with the X. But my concern is as soon as you get into a situation that takes you outside of a controlled environment, that output of that light in my mind is, I mean, look, a 120 is a struggle sometimes with ambient light. So their 200 would probably be baseline for output for me. Um, but, you know, if I'm talking about a, a day in, day out workhorse, LED chip on board fixture that I can use as a key light, um, you can go daylight but uh, and get more output. But I would go with probably a bicolor unit for versatility. So a 300 or a 600 bicolor unit for me with modifiers would be my preference and i generally prefer to go uh harder and then make it softer than just go with a panel though i think that you know the panel lights that are on the market right now for many manufacturers including aperture luxly obviously airy um you know um those you know nanlite uh the mix panel you know, that I have over here. There's just a lot of great panel lights out there, but it's just harder light is more versatile. So, and the, and the fact that so many manufacturers are going with this Bowens mount and what you can do, it can definitely make uh, a big deal. Uh, I've bought a sandbag cart and tube of death roll. They're not tech cool, but a good, and, but good staples for production and rentals. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm out of it. What do you mean by death roll? Are you talking about black wrap? Um, let me know. Uh, Suray 1.6X Anamorphic 50 full frame. Looks great. Haven't used it. Uh, but from what I can see, it's a really interesting lens i spoke about a little bit last week after watching caleb's video and i like this balance of it not being a one point you know three uh three x uh but not having to be so large and making it a two x anamorphic i'd like to use it see how it how it how it works um good all right so let's see what else do we have what other questions let's get some other questions before we start talking about this dji thing which is a very very interesting conversation to have i think i have some initial thoughts about it but what do we have regarding other questions or anything else that people want to bring up as we get pretty close to the halfway mark already which is pretty crazy um rhapsodist says the su ray breathes like hell that's a huge downside are you specifically referring to the 1.6 x anamorphic or are you talking about some of their aps-c ones 360 grad says gem please see my question above let me see i'm scrolling up here 360 gem i asked you once for your opinion on led edge soft lights i know they're not as versatile as the new amaranth but if it comes to softness which are softer uh well the edge lights are softer they can be a little funky if you look at them on frame because of how they light them up um but they are for sure out of the box softer my feeling though is even with panel lights i want to have some versatility and you know the de facto 
LED panel light on the market um, is probably the Astra 6X from uh, light panels. And that has LED um, lensing that are, I believe, 45 degrees, which I find to be very versatile because you can bounce that light very easily, but you can also um, have something that has a little bit of hardness to it. And the problem with LED edge soft lights is that's what you get. You can make them softer, but you can't make them harder unless I guess you bounce them off of a mirror and get some sort of return to force them to be a little, that light source to be a little bit harder, but then your mirror becomes your light source. It's not a good way to go. Uh, the mix panels are pretty interesting because there's a, a button you can press and it essentially has an active uh, diffusion that goes over the lighting source. Hold on, I'll press the button. So that's the um, the option. Hold on. Yeah, and then you press it again, and it becomes a softer source. So one is softer, one is harder, but they're still essentially LED panel solution. You should check that out. Mixed panel is pretty interesting fixture overall. Um, you know, any any panel where you can remove the diffusion is good in my book. I wasn't a big fan of the Astra Soft because you couldn't remove that and then have a slightly harder light. And again, I like that versatility. Um, I must have missed that part, Repsis, on the full frame one on the breathing. Um, the Sigma 50 to 150 also breathes like a mother. So I just got the Nova P300 wondering how you'd modify it to soften it beyond the aperture soft box i would say a six by six would be a good option for that you can get them from matthews uh you can get them from modern studio equipment a six by you know uh silent grid cloth is a great option and they sell them with elastic on the sides and grommets folds up into almost nothing you can take virtually any light source and push it through that six by. You can drape it between two C stands and you can get an incredibly soft key that way. Um, you could take the 300 and also create a book light where you're bouncing and then diffusing. It's generally better to use a hard source for that. So if I was using a book light, I would tend to use something like a COB light and not a Nova. Um, but it can be done, especially if you're shooting in the higher ISO clean image base camera. You know, cameras that you can push 3200 to 6400 ISO, you could in fact start with a soft source and then either bounce it or bounce and diffuse it and you'd still get uh, good results. I don't know if I'm at 25 or 3200 ISO on this X-T3, but I've just got a mixed panel 150 that's bouncing up into um, kind of the, the ceiling here. I don't know if you can sort of see it. It's hard. Let me see. Can you? Eh. You can sort of see that there's a light bouncing up into this white area. And then that's essentially my key light. So um, that's what I'm using for that particular solution. Uh, current tripod head Rex for mirrorless can be balanced for something lightweight or a slightly heavier rig. I think the question there, Neil, is how much are you willing to invest in your tripod head, your fluid head? Um, yes, those new lights from Aperture were designed to be used in smaller spaces. Absolutely. And, and great for kickers and things like that. I mean, look, I use uh, Felix, uh, is that P360s? Those are great little lights for stuff. That's what this basically is. This little kick right here is a, a P360, and uh, you know they're great. I have a little soft box on it. Let's see if you can actually see it. There it is. There's the uh, the 360, and those are great lights, but more expensive than the Aperture counterparts. So there you go. Um, Benro fluid heads, yeah. I mean, for the money, they can they can be pretty good. 
you can try those out. If you want to spend some more, you could start looking into some of the other heads from Sockler and um, I'm partial to the Miller CX heads, but they're expensive. Um, I like the CXs a lot, personally. But everybody's making decent heads right now. On the cheap end, yes, Benro. Um, when you start to get up into that next tier, Sockler for sure, but I, again, am partial to Miller heads, so the CX line are things that I like a lot. If you need to use some money up, pretty great. Um, good. Any thoughts on the A74 that's coming tomorrow? Uh, I sure as hell hope it has 10-bit 422 and uh, a, a relatively robust um, data rate inside of there. For me, what would make that camera would be um, making sure the color science, which Sony's getting better at with Cinetone and Sgamut 3.Cine is dialed in. Uh, we're dealing right now, we shot yesterday project uh, DP I had working was on an FX9 and we had to use some of Alistair Chapman's uh, LUTs, which are very similar. We were shooting Sgamut 3.Cine using LUTs that were um, there, that are available from Sony, but Alistair created minus one, minus two versions of those. Um, tends to be pretty green, so taking some of that out. Though uh, I was liking the images we were getting out of that. So if we get Cinetone, we get 10-bit 422, we get data rates that are at least 200, ideally going up to 400. I like selectable, 100, 200, 400 megabits per second. Great if it was dual ISO. Um, that definitely helps, though Sony historically does really, really great with um, with you know high ISO. Um, Baron, I'd be interested to find out what the specs are then maybe you have some information on that from uh tony northrop's video that was accidentally released a day early uh <laughs> even though he was probably embargoed for that um on photo nitro tech 608 is also a solid option i think okay yeah i think eric naso may have spoken about that on new shooter so there you go um i was preparing for the alien camera pressed enter accidentally I don't know what that means, David, but I'm ready for you to, uh, sorry too soon. Wait, does anyone know if, uh, uh, if it's as log couldn't find any information? I don't know. Any information you can share? Uh, Rapsis says we already know it has colon, and then we'll be getting some information. Mm hmm. All right. Let's talk about this thing over here. This Franken, Franken monster of a camera. And uh, wraps this. I'll be looking for your additional information on the other one. Um, mm, 360 grad. Everybody can read that. Cam gear. All right. Good to look into that. All right. Here it is. Or here's the first version of what they're going to be making going into the future. Um, Ronin 4D. Is it a camera? Is it a gimbal? What is this thing? Holy shnikes. Uh, I watched the event this morning. I went to bed early. Not for that reason, but I happened to be up. So I did. And, um, oh, okay. Sorry, David. I'm going to come back to this Ronin conversation. So you call it black roll. Uh, very, very often we call, or did you call it death roll? I don't know what the heck you called it. We normally call that roll of thick black plastic Visqueen. Uh, you can even get it through, you know, box stores like Home Depot and and uh, and Lowe's here in the states. And if you want to tent, uh, a, you know, a space from outside, then we would use Visqueen for that. So it's like very, very heavy, you know, contractor grade um, plastic that you would have for really thick contractor trash bags. Um, I think that's what you're talking about. Um, if it's like uncut trash bags, most of the time we've used it for tenting. 
and blacking out a space. So if you wanted to shoot, let's say I was shooting in this space right here and it was daytime and I didn't have blackout shades or something like that, we could tent the outside of this space with Visqueen and then basically black it out. We could put fixtures on the other side of those windows and, and shoot basically as if it was daytime. And you could shoot uh, all day long or nighttime, depending on how you want it to look. All right, here we go. Let's get back to our stuff here. And if you have any more data on that A7 IV, great. Otherwise, we'll talk about it a little bit next week when we do our wish thing. So uh, DJI Ronin 4D. To me, it's a camera first and it's a gimbal second. So when, um, I don't know if this is gonna work. Do I have a picture in picture? I don't think you wanna really see my ugly mug anyway, but I think there's a picture in picture option here. Let's see what, I'm gonna screw this up. Look at that, it worked. Okay, you can see my ugly mug here, but you can also see what's on the screen. And I don't know why when you share your screen, it does this weird scaling thing here um, in this app. But for some reason, when I move the screen down uh, on the other display, it seems to fill it up a little bit better. Does that make any sense? I don't know, but it's it's doing what it's doing. So, um, so basically, to me, this is a camera first. When DJI released the Zenmuse X7, it was a super 35 millimeter, um, you know, censored camera for drones, which had an interchangeable lens system and was really one of, if not the only quote unquote serious camera on the market that was able to also record to ProRes RAW. So um, what's interesting to me about this is they've kind of just bypassed the X7. They're going to the X9, which means full frame in this case. And I think they're doing something here which is definitely going to influence the industry for sure. And we take a look at this. We've got um, essentially the same system here that's going to be offered in two different sensor versions. But the, the hardware, the ergonomics is not going to change with the 4D. So one of our options is gonna be, and the one that's gonna be available initially is gonna be the DJI Ronin uh, 4D 6K camera. And then there's gonna be an 8K version, which looks like is coming out, still in development, but coming out next year. So if you wanna get your hands on one of these in, uh, in the year 2021, not only would I recommend you order it soon, but it's going to be the 6K version of the camera. The 8K version is going to come with a few more bells and whistles. Is also, of course, going to shoot 8K. Um, but, you know, functionally, the way the cameras are going to work, especially if you add additional accessories, is going to be the same. So the one thing that they didn't touch upon is, and when I say it's a camera first, um, uh... I'll get to that. Um, I'll get to that in a minute, David. Um, but I, I will say that the product that you're talking about is essentially Visqueen. It does come in a tube, like a trash bag, but it's not cut. Um, so I think we're talking about the same product there. So for me, the, what I want to know is, can that head, the camera itself, come off, or does it always have to be attached to the 4D system? Um, they did mention something about it being modular. So the question is, is there a way to take that camera just by itself and just put a lens on it and actually work with it um, or not? I don't really know what the answer is to that particular question. So, um, you know, let's talk about this camera. But again, you know, that's the first thing. We've got a full frame uh, ProRes raw capable camera system um, that has a gimbal. And then I think it is um, it is modular 360 grad. It's just whether or not, how do you run that camera without attaching it to everything? Is there a way I can just take the camera portion of it and somehow attach that to a tripod or something like that? I know it comes off but what's the functionality when it's off? 
how much functionality do you have on that camera when it is not attached to the rest of that hardware? And I, I'm going to have to dig a little bit deeper to see what the answers are to that. Um, to me, that's in a lot of ways the first most interesting thing about this camera is that they're clearly getting into the camera game now. Uh, it's also something that I find really interesting. You know, one of the downfalls to, in my opinion, to a company like Blackmagic is they're making some really interesting cameras, but when it comes to support for the camera systems, they don't have an ecosystem for that. And when it comes to the 6K camera of the 4D, you can spend $900 for two years of pro service. And then the 8K camera is going to be a little bit more than that. I think it's twelve dollars or $1,300 US. But that's a will basically fix anything service contract. So it's like Apple Care for the DJI Ronin 4D. I think that's great. And if they can support their cameras that way and it, they support people as pros... And judging by the people that they had using the cameras in the event, the, a lot of ASC members and a lot of high-end cinematographers, I think that we're going to see some pretty interesting things with this camera. Um, yeah, so there you go. And then, of course, we have essentially a souped-up Ronin in some ways that is specific to this camera system where they're adding that fourth axis. And if you have been following gimbal systems, especially ones like the ones from FreeFly, the Movi, and you've been following what DJI has been doing with the Ronin, you know that in order to get that fourth axis um, stability, what people are doing is they're attaching their gimbal systems to steady cams or systems like that in order to take away that you know that movement so that fourth axis i think they're calling it the z axis is the one that is also really interesting and um and then their approach to focusing is really interesting because it's not an AF camera. It's a camera where you add a LiDAR sensor and then you're basically taking, you calibrate your lenses and it, it doesn't just have to be DJI's lenses. There's going to be an M mount so you can use Leica lenses. Um, there's going to be an E mount so you can use obviously a ton of other manufacturers lenses. You're going to calibrate those and some of those are manual lenses but once they're calibrated and that distance data is there, you can effectively use the focusing system. And what's brilliant is that if you get the 7-inch monitor, which has a transmission system, transmitter, receiver, no latency it looks like, very high range, um, you're going to be able to take the handles that you see right now in that frame off of there and attach them to the monitor I, is what I'm un understanding there's also going to be a follow focus wheel that they have and you're going to be able to control that camera remotely. So that's going to be fascinating because you could get that camera, you know, 10,000 feet away up on sticks on a head and you could have complete control over it. It'll be interesting to see what they do ecosystem wise going forward from here. Um, one of the cinematographers made a comment that it's not going to replace a dolly system, right? And, and I think part of the reason it's not for them and for people who use dollies is because it's, it's not repeatable, right? So the advantage to a dolly system is you lay your track or slider and you can create repeatable moves. Once you're handheld, um, you know, shoulder mounted or whatever you're doing, it's very hard to repeat. But there's some things that you can do with this that are going to be very interesting. Uh, the other thing that will be interesting is besides going shoulder mount, like you're seeing in that shot right there, what are the options going to be for long-term handheld work? I think that, you know, one of the things that Nino over at Cine D mentioned was, and he's actually been using the camera, is that you're going to get fatigue relatively quickly with the camera system. 
So it's going to be heavy. You know, there's a lot of GAC on there. And I'm not saying that it's GAC that shouldn't be there. But, you know, um, yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be pretty interesting in terms of what it is. So, yes, if you have an existing camera system and, as you're saying, 360 grad, maybe you have a Ronin RS2, there are control features that are there. But I think that this is its own thing. And this is the start of DJI really moving into they're inadvertently not inadvertently but their drones and their you know gimbals are definitely adopted by people in professional environments for sure but I think this is really where they start to step into the the ocean right this is the, they're they're swimming now they're not in the pond they're in in the big in the big ocean now um, they're hanging out but interestingly um, and I think surprisingly, well, I was surprised to see some people's comments about there being a problem with the price of this system. Because when I look at this system on paper, um, I, I think that the price point is pretty remarkable for what you're getting. You know, um, you know, look at what this system can do. The ND, up to nine stops of real NDs on there. Um, there's so much to find out about this system and what it is. But the peripherals are very affordable in terms of what they cost. And I think, you know, you're talking about a price point sans without lenses that's $7,200 US, which is pretty kitted out. You're obviously gonna have to add extra batteries and chargers and media, and of course your lens system, but pretty remarkable in terms of what you're getting for $7,200. Um, I don't know. It's gonna be interesting. I think it's gonna be funky when it comes to hand holding this in more traditional situations, I think that, um, you know, we're talking about something that I guess could be an everyday camera system for people. I really want to wait until this comes out and gets into the hands of people who were not high end cinematographers who don't have an entire crew behind them and find out what is this product like for small to no crew production? Are we going to get frustrated by the fact that it's on a gimbal all the time? Or is it going to be easy peasy to put a plate on the bottom of this thing, pop it onto a good fluid head and lock, you know, that access so that you can use the camera in a traditional way as well? I don't know. Mm. what do you think hope they make a smaller version that is dumbed down they could definitely take the Zen Muse X7 and do that um, don't need raw or the wireless controller I think you're going to get that anyway even if they make a smaller version you're definitely going to get ProRes raw so I don't know um Oh, I see, David. All right, well, send me a link to that. I'd be interested to see what it is. I don't think I have a lot of application for it, but it could be interesting, that product. Um, do we know how heavy this cam is? Uh, I think it's listed on here. I don't know. Uh, let me just do a quick thing on weight. Let's see. Anybody know the spec on weight? If you want to hit New Shooter or Cine D and see... If um, there's any information on that, that would be great. I don't know exactly how heavy it is. Sans lenses, I think it's it's gonna be it's gonna have some heft to it. Um, it's gonna be weird, you know, with that camera. I, I I'm sure it's semi balanced, but I think it's it feels to me like it's gonna be leaning a little bit. And of course, it's on a gimbal and it's going to be being controlled. So that's going to also feel a little bit strange. Um, 
it's going to be interesting to see what happens with all this stuff. Bill's going to stick with the Osmo action for now. Um, David says, yeah, right. See the competition. Uh, I'm what, David? I'm interested to know what that is. Comment too. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Like... I don't know if I would have taken this seriously if they said it was under $5,000 US. There's a lot of technology inside of that camera system. Uh, head is removable and it does lock off. I would expect it to lock off. So it's just going to be... I, I think that if you're going to tripod mount this and you're going to use it in those situations, it's going to make a lot of sense to have... Uh, smaller lenses and the good thing is there are smaller you know lenses out there including zooms um be interested to see how it feels if you were doing e-mount fujinon lenses like the 18 to 55 the 50 the is it 150 or 135 um you know the mx lenses so yeah Key grips just became first shooters. It's funny. Um, so, David, do you feel that the price is reasonable or do you think that it's overpriced? Because, again, I saw some people thinking that this was high priced. You know, it's interesting because if we're looking at the market in general, if this was three years ago, then, you know, your mind completely explodes. What you have to look at is, is the 4D a camera system that you could see yourself using outside of a rental for specific applications? Can you use this camera for the type of shooting that you do or the types of shooting that you do on a regular basis? Or are you better off looking at options from companies that are offering similar resolutions, dynamic range, capabilities you know c300 mark 3 fx9 uh obviously you've got you know and, and and i'm bringing those cameras up because of their af systems and that i consider them digital cinema cameras which is where i'm putting this ronin 4d or is it going to be really funky in terms of form factor so that when you're not using the camera in that handheld situation how's that going to be i think the other thing to talk about is whether or not we think dji is going to make a solution for the camera that's going to be um but the gimbal's there oh i was i thought you were just, i was like thought you were being serious chris um do we need like an easy rig or something else but that limits range of motion and to me, I mean, I'm a pretty short person. One of the things that I find myself needing to do is getting a camera up higher for certain things. And not only is that hard when you're shooting with a camera system like this, but is there something that will, you know, like I would love to see DJI come up with something that says, okay, we've, we've created this product. Here's a VES-based system, but it has a spring. It understands that your camera is going to be between this weight range and this weight range, and we're going to give you um, full range of motion with that support system i don't know uh david says definitely reasonable and keep in mind that they don't have that kind of money uh that i don't have that kind of money but if you look into the competition with those specs they are nowhere no way close yeah uh what happens if you would mount the 4d on a ronin rs2 <laughs> i think uh they would cancel each other out 360 grad and then there you go uh Roz, there you go uh, thanks, Ben. <laughs> I don't know what the, that's a joke. Um, that many dimensions creates a time machine. I think so. Uh, or uh, uh, a black hole or something. I think uh, maybe there's string theory in there as well. Who knows what happens when you put a Ronin on a Ronin and then you put that on a Movi. Imagine that. That would be pretty interesting. There you go. Uh, I can't believe it. Are we almost at the end here? 3.59 p.m. Unbelievable. Um, yeah, there you go. So what do I think? 
I think we've got a new a new camera on the market. I think we have something that is uh, is definitely going to shake things up. I mean, I will say that in my opinion, one of the things the answer is definitely forty two. Um, my opinion is we're looking at a. I need a drink reminder. Um, we're looking at a product here that's not going to be for everyone. Absolutely for sure. Is it a new product category? In a way it is. Um, it's definitely something that we haven't seen by a manufacturer before. But also remember that when we talk about camera manufacturers, especially the big ones, the Sonys, the Canons, the Aries, when they're developing camera systems, they're not reacting to something that came out today and saying, in six months, you're going to see something that's the same or similar to that. So I don't expect that from the market right now. Um, there may be some other companies out there that will do that, which will take the chance and react quickly to it. Um, Confinity, you know, companies like that, possibly. But yes, Bill, that nine, I mentioned that the nine stops of ND is amazing, great. And from uh, Cine D, they said they noticed no discernible color shift when you're going up to that many, when you're going up to 2.7. I think that's fantastic. So I think it's great. Look, there's nothing wrong with what DJI is doing right now. And they're, they're definitely hanging out with some big players. They're trying to go into this higher end market and let's be honest, when we're talking about feature film production, we're talking about episodic television production, and you talk about a 6K camera solution with the capabilities which nobody else has in an integrated system. And by the way, let's not forget, there's like no cables on this thing, which is bonkers, right? It's like you take this thing out and there, are, there aren't cables everywhere, right? They've, they've thought about an ecosystem and you price that camera at $7,200 US, $11,000, whatever, $500 or whatever it is for the other thing. And you talk about Hollywood feature film production. These are crash camps. You know, as long as it records and you can get the footage, they don't care. They'll drop 10 grand on the camera and crash that thing or have it in some crazy explosion situation. It's all good. If they can do... Um, eventually not just a, a 1080 transmission but they can get a, a 4k transmission and record that clean then you really get into interesting stuff because you've got a camera that they'll just destroy as long as they get their recording because it's just no money to them but i think that the focusing system is going to be very interesting we'll see where camera companies go with that it does have two full xlr inputs on the camera so there you go um we got that a7 IV. We're going to check that thing out. That could be really interesting. If that comes in at anywhere between you know $2,500 and $3,000 US and does what it's supposed to, that's going to be a great product in the market. And then, yes, Chris, we have Dune coming out, or at least part one, even though they're not branding it as that. Um, yeah, the LiDAR is probably the most interesting and the one thing that I want to see more about. I, is XLR an add-on? When we saw the event, I thought that's on the back of the camera body, Shazam. Are you 100% sure? I thought it was on the side, but I missed that then. Let me just check. Uh, oh, you are right, sir. Let's just go ahead and take a look at that. You'll see that we've got 4D expansion plate, SDI, XLR, time code. Be interested to know how much that is because quite honestly that one particular module right there would be a no-brainer for me that would be the one module that I'd probably get right out of the gate in terms of what I'd be using um, is it definitely I wonder how much it's gonna be anybody know about that I don't know um, yeah, and 4.67 kilograms um, with everything. So that's the whole setup sans lenses. So that'll be interesting to see. So it's still a lot to um, 
learn about. I'd be interested to see how much that extra module is. And Bill says the future of filmmaking is here. It could be. There you go. <laughs> My Canon battery feels so dumb now. Sad. Well, it doesn't have that heating technology. I, I wonder if, you know, one of the things that happens with batteries, of course, is if you shoot in the cold with them, you don't get as much time out of them. And I'd love to see a comparison with this intelligent battery in a cold environment because it essentially keeps the battery warm. Um, the assumption is that you're going to get the same amount of time, but I wonder if that's true when that feature activates or if you're just getting better than you would if you were shooting with a regular quote-unquote dumb battery. I don't know. There we go. Uh, next week, we should have Caleb back. We should have Ben back. We should be talking about our crappy-ass stuff from Wish. David, you're supposed to get me a PDF and hopefully join in for a part of the show. Talk about your headphones. And uh, I agree, Neil, it's still using energy to heat that battery, right? It's got to. So you've got to have at least some decrease in terms of what you're getting. That's what I've got for everybody today. I think we talked about what we need to talk about. Good to know that that expansion plate is an expansion plate. If somebody can find out how much that thing is, I definitely want to have time code. I definitely want to have SDI, and I definitely want to have XLR inputs if I'm using this as a main camera system. Am I getting it? Not now. I'm going to do a wait and see. I'm taking that approach for all of them. Um, yeah. There you go. Everybody, it's been great. Love chatting. Need this break every week. So sorry it's just me solo, but hopefully we had a good conversation. And I'll see you next Wednesday, the 27th. And uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and get this stuff done. Tools they are, David. And let's find out how usable they are. Let's wait for everybody else to see what happens with this DJI. Maybe it'll be one of you, Ronin 4D. Uh, rolling shutter is a big question. You know, they talked about the history of cameras. Here I am signing off and then talking again. And they they talk, hey, Film Kit, um, they talk about CCDs, which, of course, don't suffer from the same rolling shutter situations that we have with CMOS unless you have very fast readouts. I guess we'll find out more about this sensor and what it does and everything else. It was, you know, there you go. See ya. Bye, everybody. I'm going back to work.